All right, I'm uh, Mortimer Augustus Cox. Why they named me that, I'll never know. Um, I, I was born April 15, 1919, in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, it's, it's, uh, when did you first move here to the Atlanta area? I moved to Atlanta. Um, June of 1946, September of 1946, uh, I had decided to use my GI Bill for college education. It's interesting how I selected, everybody asked me, why did you select Atlanta? Why did you select Marsh Brown College of School? Um, I'm a son of a coal miner in the steel, out of the steel mills of Birmingham. Um, Returning from the war and my experience in the Marine Corps said to me that uh, while my parents could uh, not afford me the privilege to consider college at graduation from high school in 1937, knowing that I had the ability to utilize the GI Bill of Rights, uh, I decided I would do that. Uh, I didn't see a future in the steel mill. And, basis of my experience in the Marine Corps. And I wrote to um, every black, historical black college in this country in a large city. I was concerned that I needed a large city in order to supplement my income because I was married at that time. Um, most of them in 46 was overfilled with the returning World War II veteran. And I began to get, not this year, we're full. Full. Finally, I received a letter from Morris Brown in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, and they said they had an opening and that they, they would accept me. They wanted five dollars deposit on my room, incidentally, and I could afford that, so I took that. That's why I chose Atlanta. Exactly. Well, no, I'll never forget it. I was at a Sunday afternoon's tea. Uh, those is what we had in my community, teas on Sunday. They were church-related activities. And, of course, you would always go and you'd do such ex exciting things as dance, maybe. But spend the ball and kiss the girl, yes. And we would always uh, attend those. And that was a late Sunday afternoon uh, uh, in uh, uh, that year, and we were there, and someone happened to turn on the radio. And we heard over the radio, and the president was speaking, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And of course, all of us had registered for the draft, but uh, we were just waiting on our number to come up, because all of the teenage boys were there, and the girls. And we listened for the rest of the afternoon. I don't think we spent the ball at all that day because we were concerned. But I can remember, I can remember the house. And quite often, if I'm in Birmingham, I'll drive past. The uh, latest name was Miss Pittman. And I said, there's where I was, December the 7th, 1941. But uh, it's very clear in my mind because it changed my life. Well, um, when you to go to uh -huh. and in um, 1942, I began to think seriously, and the draft was on all young men mind. And of course, I was thinking I did not want the army, because blacks were limited in the army. I had a brother who had volunteered several years early, yeah, and what he was doing did not impress me. Of course, the travel was always intriguing. But uh, just the activity did not impress me. The Navy, from what I had seen, I'd seen blacks who were in uh, uniform, but most of them were, uh, were, were either butlers, uh, waited tables aboard ship. That did not appeal to me. Um, there was a paper which was um, 
uh, printed a black newspaper, the uh, Birmingham Daily World. It was a branch of the Atlanta Daily World. It was printed here in Atlanta, but it was primarily news about blacks in there. I saw the announcement that uh, the Marine Corps were accepting blacks. And of course, I thought this was a challenge. Uh, I realized they didn't have the kind of segregation that existed in the other major services, so that I thought I would go down what I thought just to get some more information. And uh, I went to the post office and found myself taking a test, and I passed the test and I was sworn in that day. Uh, I guess if I'd had to think about it, I don't know what I would have done. But uh, when I found myself being uh, given the oath of office and then told I was uh, a Marine and I was no longer subject to the draft, that of course gave me some relief. Now, I, I did not immediately go in. I didn't know why. I went back home and from that was June, I guess about June the 12th, I believe it was. And I went back home. All my friends were being drafted and was going in the service. I was home. I heard nothing from the Marine Corps at all. And it was only in late August of 42, I received my orders. You will report to camp. Uh, um, Mumford Point Camp, New River, North Carolina on such and such a date with a ticket aboard the train to North Carolina. And that was the first I had. And when I got there, there were very few blacks. I believe there was, I only saw about five or six blacks. That was September 1. And of course, the next over several days, each day was bringing more in so that I ended up being in what we call the first platoon of blacks, the first 40 men who began training. I was in that outfit and I began, found myself in boot camp at that time, becoming a Marine. Um, it was very traumatic. We had an, a, a situation where there were no blacks to provide the initial training. So these were all whites who were to give us the boot training. And if you know anything about then what boot training incurred, it was traumatic. Those of us uh, from the South did not have as much of a culture shock as is those young men who were coming out of Chicago, out of New York, and out of the Midwest who came and would find themselves in Washington, D.C., and they'd have to move in the back of the train so that they came on board in the camp angry and uh, because they felt they were offering the highest duties. Interesting enough, most of uh, that group of 40 men had some college, some graduates out of college. Uh, it was a creaming. Uh, why, I don't know. Maybe they were the ones who could pass the initial test. Um, but they were angry and very, very hostile. So that um, it was because that special service group that was assigned to give us our training did it with the enthusiasm and I guess the lust that the Marines had had for 200 years prior to that. So. It was, uh, it was an experience. It was hard to differentiate what was racial and what was required of training. The very training is to get you to think as a group. So you, you, those of us who had never been into it, I'd never been to a, a, a camp. Years later, as I got older and began to broaden my experience, I could see that in day camp, youngsters are taught to think as a group and be responsible for the group so I could understand it. But I had never had that experience and I suppose most of the, the um, uh, youngsters that were there had not had that kind of experience. So we didn't know what was racial and what was training. 
so that it was very, very difficult there. Did you all like, talk about it when, when you weren't Very traumatic. Um, mm -hmm. Did the southerners talk to the northerners? Mm-hmm. We took, we, we, we almost took uh, a kind of attitude that we're responsible for the group. So first of all, we felt a closeness to those black leaders who were pushing for equal opportunity for blacks, like A. Philip Randolph, uh, and uh, the guy who was head of the National Urban League and NAACP, who were actually talking to the president, looking for opportunities for young, young people in service. And we felt the obligation, especially those from the South. You had um, uh, youngsters out of Talladega, in Talladega, Alabama, uh, Alabama A&M in Montgomery, uh, Mohouse College and Clark uh, are here. So those educated blacks began to take an attitude that we can't let the race down. They don't want us in the Marine Corps, but we cannot fail. If we fail, it'll be because they just made the decision, not that we could not do it. So that we began to form, uh, we didn't know it, uh, support groups at night, that we would rehash those traumatic experiences that an individual had had and try to put it in perspective. And looking back during the earlier years and uh, when students began to integrate white institutions, there was one thing I tried to get our organization, the Muffle Point Marine, that's a group of, national group of black Marines, to form those kind of groups in the black community to get young people to realize and see the big pictures we would always say you know do your task and do it well but it never really happened but it was very difficult to go through that training and keep everybody everybody on the concern now, mm -hmm. how old were you when you went to now as i told you see i had been out of high school since 1937 so I was what, what, 42, that meant I was uh, 18, I was 23, okay. 23, uh-huh. So were you, were you about, were you older, younger, or about the same age? As most about the same age, okay. about the same age. As soon as the Marine Corps had to accept, later on in 43, the Marine Corps had to select selective service, which was that body of men that selective service, the local Selective service would refer to the service and they would be assigned out. Now, when you begin to get that kind of uh, person, you begin to get younger, more hostile blacks who didn't understand. I don't want to be in the war anyway. You see, nobody really wanted to go in the war, but they realized they had to. But that was my age. Um, Jacksonville was an experience. Um, it was a small town who depended on the Marine barracks for its existence. But they didn't take kindly to black Marines, and the black Marines were the one closest to them. The Marine barracks was farther and across the railroad tracks, so that uh, uh, they viewed us as outsiders, and they felt we weren't going to be there long. They felt, I guess maybe it was a saying, that this is a trial, and they if they fail, it will close, so that uh, that was their first impression. Uh, but it was. Travel, there were some experiences that even I, having been born and raised all of my life in the South, other than just going to New York or Washington to visit relatives or something, it was traumatic to me um, because there was always in, in, in Birmingham, where I was born and reared, there was always, even downtown, theaters and cafes, you know. You had all of your social organizations and your churches as support groups. But here in Jacksonville, a country town with very few blacks and no, quote, black society. So it was traumatic. Um, the bus drivers had never had to adjust to black troops. And if we wanted, the closest liberty places were either in Wilmington, or Durham, or Newburn, the north where they had black uh, 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 population, 
so that most of us, we had to take a bus. But the bus drivers would always enforce segregation. You had to be in the back seat. So you formed two lines, which was unusual, you know, and hard to accept because I got on a uniform just like you. But uh, uh, usually about four or five blacks would get on the black back seat and he would fill up the bus with the white troops. So that uh, that got to be a problem, especially with those of us who had then moved up where we had began to replace the special service troops and we were becoming NCOs ourselves. Uh, we had to deal with a fact that here's a youngster who goes on leave, but he comes back AWOL, and it's not his fault because we had experienced firsthand that you just couldn't get the bus. You know, only five of you are gonna get out on a bus, you know what I mean? So you're more likely to be absent without leave. So that uh, we increasingly began to press uh, the commanding officer. Now, it's to his credit that the person who was selected as commanding officer, Colonel Samuel Woods, accepted the position because he wanted to do it. He actually asked for the assignment, and I've heard him tell me a million times uh, why he had the, the name of the group was 51st Defense Battalion, and his pride and joy was that he, how he selected 51st. He said he selected the five and the one because George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, the two persons that appear on the five and the one dollar bill was most liked by blacks and that was how he got it but he was very 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 fair and the only thing that really bothered me as a colonel with a long tenure in the Marine Corps he could look you in the eye and tell you I can't control this and he couldn't but so he would come up with a point with buses he would assign the troop trucks to go to cities like Newburn and carry them on Liberty. So we had our trucks, and interesting enough, whites who were running late and missed the last bus would be big and pleading, let us on your bus to get back to camp, because we could stay a little later. We didn't have to abide by the uh, bus schedule. So we could stay, and he always assigned a non-commissioned officer so that the MPs, which were old Marines who resented the blacks, did not have to inface, interface with us. So that they would always say, where's your NGO? And he'd turn them over. He did. I caught him doing such and such a thing. And of course, we would handle that. But it was interesting though. I can remember one night, they finally, in 1953, and I just happened to remember that because I read when my wife and I had got our first house and quit rooming, they got an apartment. They built apartments on the base for black non coms who had a family. So the family's there, and when I married, my wife and I had an apartment there, and uh, we were laughing. In December of that year, um, out in, uh, in Jacksonville on that coast, it's very cold. The wind is awful. Uh, usually on a cold day you can feel little flakes of ice in the wind. But uh, dealers with coal, coal was limited, would not let the troop, and we had to buy coal in order to heat the apartment, would not sell us any coal. Coal would come in and you'd go down to pick up some coal and they said, no, all of this is promised. So finally uh, we convinced Colonel Woods, the commanding officer, we have a problem. And he said, what? Well, we told him. And he immediately, we had a mountain of coal for the steam boiler to do the heating on the base. And he says, that's awful. Get you some trucks and back up to that pile and get all the coal you need. So we never bought no more coal. It was that kind of thing. But he was a thoughtful, caring person. Uh, the camp was not all bad. We had some pluses. There was a young um, lieutenant who was a sign, he was a radical, they said. I guess he was the forerunner of the so-called hippies. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Robert uh, Troop, and I've seen some uh, uh, movies. He was out of Hollywood. 
but he knew all of the band leaders, uh, the actors who were black and everything. Uh, we had a movie, but by the time we got the movies uh, from the main base, they would be old and not seen. He had a direct contact with Hollywood. He could call and of course they would send movies in. Most of the band leaders then, uh, Count Basie and Lionel Hampton, he knew them and he would have them on the base. Uh, one of the most interesting article, I mean, the incident on the base is that the commanding officer of the toll camp, Camp Lejeune, heard that we had a black boxer who was very good. I can't think of his name, but he was coming to give us an ex ex exhibition as a result of Lieutenant Troop's invitation. And everybody wanted to see it. He wanted to see the battle, you know. He came down, and the guys, like most youngsters, are noisy. And you know how you are at a boxing game. That bothered that, that uh, Joan. And he issued an order for all of the troops to be quiet. And of course, you know, say, you know, you're on our turf. You know what I mean? And, and this is for us. You're just a guest here. But uh, he made... He had really turned them off because at the time he came over to see the troops. We really trained the troops to be very precise in drilling and to do it exact. And it was a thing of beauty to watch those young fellows drill. And he had, in talking to them, said uh, he had just returning from the Pacific. And he says, you know, I'm just back from the Pacific. He said, I've seen women marine. I've seen dog marine, and now when I see you people, and I guess he was trying to make a point. I believe in my heart, now as I reflect on it, he was trying to make a point. Now when I see you people, I know we're at war, and of course, the guy's afraid to boo a general, you know. But the next time, he was coming this particular night, and the guy says, he going to let him see it by himself. We're not going. And we just pass over the camp. And we knew that to come Woods, that was going to put him in a pretty bad uh, light to be a camp commander. And the, toll, uh, uh, the commander of the toll camp was coming, and none of the troops were going to be there. So we didn't know what to do. So we decided we would declare what we call uh, a punishment that you would do a camp cleaning. Nobody could say anything. Where are the troops? They're on punishment. And that was going to be our way to do it. But the colonel came in. He sent for his non-com then and asked him, fellas, I can't let there. The guy's got to be there. He's going to know something, you know. But we did relent, and the troops did go. But it's, it's that kind of thing that you had openly. Well, my first assignment, as I, I told you, I, I came in to be assigned to the 51st Defense Battalion. Uh, by 1993, when the war had changed, and I, I suppose troops were uh, at risk then, interestingly enough, uh, the whites were gone. We, they, they, they kept the 51st Defense Battalion, but they realized they would have to have a cadre of troops to continue training those blacks who were coming in out of the selective service. Mm -hmm. So that uh, uh, they set up what they call recruit depot training. And Colonel Woods took that camp, and another colonel took over the 51st Defense Battalion. And he asked me, if I would be one of those who would stay. He said, he liked my style, he liked my leadership qualities, and will you stay? And of course, at that time, I had, um, uh, it's interesting, and the whole story goes back to the first six blacks who made PFC. That was the first time in the history of Marine Corps blacks had ever made. I was one of those. And I had, by this time, I think I was a buck sergeant. They had to pull the whites out and they had to put us on fast track for promotion. So we were about every three months getting a promotion. That's unheard of in the Marine Corps. 
<coughs> pardon me, but uh, 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 he had asked me to stay and to serve as first sergeant of A Company, which was the first recruit training company we were going to have. And of course, that's when I decided to get married. I says, I'm going to be here, and he told me all about the plans for apartments, and you'll be here for the rest of the war, just training troops. Gee, that was nice. So uh, I accepted, and uh, it was that point, then I began to get over. But in 1944, uh, the commanding officer of Camp Lejeune then returned from the Pacific to do duty back in the States. He had been out long enough. And he came over, and he had seen black troops overseas, but always under the supervision of white non-com. And when he came over and saw First Sergeant, Gunnery Sergeant, he was amazed. He had been on Saipan, incidentally, the first activity of blacks in the Pacific, the, the Japanese they didn't know uh, that the troops had been trained. They thought all they could do was hound supplies. But when the troops broke through, they laid down, grabbed weapons, and began to uh, the, uh, stop the Japanese. And of course, at that point, uh, there was an article in Time magazine. It was right after all uh, the sailor aboard the ship who grabbed the gun and actually began to do it at Pearl Harbor. And all of that came back, so it was an article. So it began to take an attitude. His feeling was the troops would be better off. He looked around and saw a whole cadre of black non-coms that he didn't know existed. So he then um, said that he was going to begin to send black non-coms out. That uh, must have been, I guess, mid-summer of 44. And uh, with my seniority and my connection with Colonel Woods, I would always miss. You know, I could always say someone else. And finally, Colonel Woods said to me, he said, Sergeant, they're going to get you, and you're going to have to go. You better, you better be selective. And of course, that was a company with a friend of his who was going over with the 36th. And he wanted me, and Colonel Woods wanted me to go because he felt that he could do a good deed to a friend of his. And of course, uh, I had to go, and that was traumatic, but uh, I went and got uh, in Pearl Harbor uh, December the 15th, five days before Christmas, lonely, mad, and mm -hmm. deserted, and not knowing what I was going to do. But it was Pearl Harbor and Honolulu at Christmas time. I guess it was nice. But um, we did, and of course, the rest is history, because in uh, 44, we began doing immediately um, uh, maneuvers and training um, immediately after Christmas, uh, and that led right up until um, February of 44, or 45 then, isn't it? Yeah, 45. Now, which uh, unit were you assigned to when you went to Pearl Harbor? We were assigned with a unit of what they call uh, a, a depot company, a battalion, I guess it was. It was something new for the Marine Corps which handled all of the supplies. See, the Marine Corps, prior to that, had had encounters in which it would go ashore and was able to supply itself. It was almost skirmishes. But for the first time, the Marine Corps found itself at a Saipan, which would need reinforcement, medical uh, personnel, would need the whole thing the same as an army, because they were fighting wars just like an army. But it was not equipped to handle that. So they began to come up with depot companies with barrel detail, uh, um, uh, uh, um, armament, uh, you know, armaments, and uh, the whole ammunition, supplies. Had to supply all of the troops as once they were on board because they could only carry so much during the initial adjustment. So that we were assigned to one of those companies, and uh, we began to maneuver. Um, 
uh, unloading and reloading. We actually wore out the equipment there during January and the 1st of February prior to Iwo Jima, uh, just training so that by the time we got to Iwo Jima, we were just like the Army going aboard with the, the, the artillery coming on in faces with your supplies, and that's what the company I did. We handle uh, no ammunition, we handle clothing, water, and oh, the wonderful brandy that they gave injured. And that's another whole story, <laughs> but, but that was nice duty. Yeah. So you were, you were there training until February, and then in February, right. We actually, yes, we actually went in uh, to uh, uh, Iwo Jima and was there. I was there when the flag, every time you see that flag, it uh, brought on a different kind of meaning because I had no idea. I had nothing to compare it with. I thought it was difficult, um, but I just thought that was war, and it was only in reflect and in re reading and the deaths. I had never seen that much uh, death before in my life, and that, of course, bothered me. And I was certain that I was not going to get off. But um, now, when did you actually go ashore? Did y'all go? Yes, we went. You you go by D plus D days. D right. day is D, and the day after is D plus one. We went D plus five, and that was because you just couldn't get ashore because everything just logged up and. What, it was about D plus five when uh, you actually see the flag raising on Iwo Jima in which the Japanese could actually pinpoint any island. They could look and see a group of men. They'd know exactly how to set their weapons and hit it. So that, that just actually tied the troops up on the beaches. And you couldn't until, that's the importance of um, Mount Saribacha and uh, the flag raising. Yeah, so when you saw the flag up, you knew that they had conquered the island where the army, where they could actually, it's a mountain, it's the top of the mountain, and they had pinpointing all of that control so that once they put that flag up, that was a signal to the troop that that was secured and you no longer had to fear the, uh, the uh, being uh, attacked with the emplaced guns in that mountain. But uh, we went in um, very early. We were... There is no place for you to hide with the Marine Corps at invasion. <laughs> Whether you go in D plus one or D plus ten, they need you. But it was a one of a nasty black sand, um, just as black as that chair. And um, by the, uh, the first four days with the body parts and the bodies, Flies were big, and uh, it was a, a stink that you never would forget. Now, where, when you were on shore, how close did you guys deploy to the front? I mean, did you have people taking supplies up to the front, or were they coming back to you? No, you, you carry the supplies. The only man I lost uh, in my company, I had uh, 160 men in my company. And because uh, I, I was first sergeant, I, I laugh about it now. First sergeants uh, do nothing but to receive the reports and announce it out. That's his responsibility. But uh, it, uh, you, you, there's no background. Iwo Jima is not large enough. Very small island. Um, not uh, any larger, I would say, than what you call Buckhead so that you're on the front line when you're there. So it, 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 it is, it was an experience. With the company mm -hmm. you were leading, were they all black? All black, yes. Mm -hmm. um, the officers were white. That's a whole different story. Um, after the war, uh, after Iwo Jima, we returned to uh, Hawaii for rest and um, what they call R&R. <laughs> rest and recreation. Um, that was very good duty. We were stationed on the big island of, of uh, Hilo. Um, that's the big island of Hawaii. Hawaii itself over and against uh, Honolulu, which is on Oahu. But it's the largest item, primarily uh, sugar cane, 
uh, pineapple and bananas. Uh, we were assigned a camp, the black troops. They had some trouble. Most of the Hawaiians, the true Hawaiians were at that time, back in the 40s, were on uh, the Big Island and uh, living in small cities around Hilo. Hilo was where most of the tourists would come in. That was a city like Honolulu is. But in the camp, which is out in the suburbs, there was a dole pineapple camp. And they decided to put us in this camp as black troops. Perhaps we could get along with the natives better, which we did. But it was just like being in paradise, having been on Iwo Jima and that black sand with no food, to be able to reach out of your, your, your wonder and pick a ripe banana, you know, for breakfast, eat all the pineapple you want, you know, it was, a, it was quite fun. But even that did not last because uh, after about, I guess about two months uh, after that, by summer we got there right after Easter when uh, Iwo Jima was secured and Let's see, um, well, uh, the European war was over around uh, uh, August, I believe it was, of 45. I, I do I remember my history correct? I'm thinking about how I lived it. I can remember that. Uh, I can remember hearing, it was on that island, that Franklin Roosevelt died down in Warm Spring, that Truman became president and um, that um, we were gearing up at that time, began to do the maneuvers again for another march. We did not know it at that time, what it was going, or where it was going to be, but we were doing about the same thing we had done back in September, and after you've done it once, you did this before and you know what happened. But then in September, uh, the first, um, uh, uh, a bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, and we did not know it. Only then we had put together that we were getting preparing to invade Japan because we began to do certain things. You would not have the sand beach in as long, which told us that we were going into a port. So uh, we did so. We were praying for the second bomb. You know, everybody was, you know, and I, I still do not blame historians now second-guess Truman about that second bomb, but I thank him for it because we didn't. So that when they finally uh, uh, surrendered, we actually covered the territory that we were preparing to invade, and we went in the uh, naval base on the southern island of Japan, Sasebo the naval base uh, in Japan, we actually made the occupation for that section of the island that we were going. I imagine everybody took what they were supposed to do. But that is where the end, the war ended. Um, I had been in now four years. I'd been overseas. I had rank. And they began to let you out based on the point system. And then, uh, well, December of uh, 45, I had the points, and I applied, I applied at that point uh, to be released. And, uh, of course, uh, 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 I had an opportunity, and uh, I knew most of the people who were in charge, and they kept saying, you want to go back on a nice liberty ship, you, you don't want to go. And finally, I said, I'll take anything. It was after Christmas, and I told my wife I was coming home, and it didn't. And I waited until, I waited all of January of 46, and nothing good came through. Finally, about the end of January, I said, I'll take whatever it is. And I got an LST, and LST is a flat bottom ship that can pull up on the beach. And I came back from Japan on an LST. Yeah, that was a that was a trip. But all I wanted was the United States, and I wanted to get back home again. I was ready for the war. I was. I am not. 
uh, a soldier, uh, I would get the orders for the company, always from the commander. And the thing that bothered me, and I hear it now, on, on September, I mean on July 26, 1999, at 0100, you will, you see, re, you know, move to such and such a thing, report to so and so. That bothers me, you know. I mean, you have nobody enters into it. Um, I remember telling Colonel Woods the day I got my orders to uh, uh, report to the company that I had, and that was the way. And my wife was there alone, didn't know anyone uh, there on the base, but I had not had chance enough to get the furniture and get everything moved, you know. And I was just about ready to tell him, I'm not going to do it. They're going to have to shoot me or do something. I'm not going to leave my wife here, you know, alone. She'd never been away from home. But he said, Sergeant, we're going to tell your wife. We're going to pack the furniture. We're going to see that she gets on the train, see that she gets home. You've got nothing to worry about. As a colonel, I believe you, but I don't believe them other folks out there. <laughs> you know? Fatigues. I had fatigues, just straight fatigues. Camos or mm, the old, uh, what we call the olive green, okay. um, twill, like um, somewhat like this. Okay. It's about this color comes in. Maybe that's why I like these trousers. <laughs> uh, you know, it was olive green. Uh, that you had a helmet, steel helmet, and that was it. We left. We left um, uh, uh, Norfolk. It was a wonderful trip for a country boy uh, to leave Norfolk, go down the Pacific, and take about three or four days through the Pan Panama Canal. Didn't even feel like it was cold. See, it was in October. And once you got down to Hilton Head, the sun was out, you pull off your clothes and lay on the beach on a nice new USS, named after a county in New York. See, they were having these Liberty ships. And we just thought we were going to heaven, you know what I mean? And then lay up uh, in, um, in uh, Panama, we had to wait because the ships went through the canal based on priority. And I guess our priority wasn't high enough. So we would just sit there. You go on Liberty one day, and every other day you could go on Liberty and see the nice girls out there. I guess we had more money because we didn't have anything to do with the money we were going to have. We were going overseas. But it was a wonderful, and to experience the Panama Canal, uh, that I really uh, appreciated. Uh, it was only when we got uh, to the West Coast and we joined uh, then an armada with the battle wagon, the, the destroyers, the other troop ships, and we went from there to Japan because we were in enemy waters then. No smoking at night, you know, no lights on the deck, uh, always with, uh, your, uh, with your gear. If you went on topside, you could never go topside and uh, with it not full gear and uh, prepare to evacuate because you don't know when you're going to be uh, struck with a torpedo or something in enemy waters. Now, were you carrying weapons at uh, Iwo Jima? Or were you wearing a sidearm? Or... I, I wore a sidearm, which didn't seem to be accurate enough, a 45. Uh, that wasn't enough. I finally took on a carbine, which was a rifle, and could be accurate. Uh, up to about uh, 200 yards, and I had fired it, so I, I knew I could do it. And I wanted to be able to shoot. 45 is all right for hand-to-hand -hand combat when you're close up on you, but you could miss, I could miss you firing if I wasn't very careful, this distance with a 45, but a uh, carbine or something like that. But most troops carry that. Now, um, a first sergeant was required with a sidearm. But uh, 
that looks good in the States, <laughs> but you want something a little bit more effective, you know. Now, were the, the rest of them in your company also carrying carbine? All of them. You were issued a carbine uh, in boot crank camp. And that was your that was your baby. You kept it. You never let a piece of rust show on it, and you carried it with you. And the only time you could survey that is when it wouldn't fire. Yeah. Now the uh, everybody tells stories about the famous uh, Marine K bar knocker. Did you guys carry the no. K bar? No, we were not. See, really and truly, um, most of the weapons where Marines had been fighting hand-to-hand -hand. at World War II, they began to change. We began to see a change for that because that was a different kind of war. You began to go like down to the Pacific. You remember Haiti and all of that weather marine, what, the halls of Montezuma, you know, down in Mexico, all of that stuff. That was when they had the hand-to-hand -hand combat. We, uh, we did, when I first went in, uh, jiu-jitsu, and all of that was in for hand-to-hand -hand combat. But increasingly, the Pacific did away from that. The Japanese, they, they shoot you down. They, no hand-to-hand. -hand. Yeah. What's that? Can you talk about the pets of food that you ate? Food was always good in an in installation, a camp. And good cooks, uh, always. Um, yeah, I can remember I was telling you about Hilo on the Big Island of Hawaii. There on the top of, what is the mountain name? I've forgotten. There, it looked like Texas, and they have a beef round. We would send up every morning and get steaks, steaks that were about that thick and about that big. And I had a mess sergeant who could really cook a steak, you know, and well, that was it. But it would really be a roast. It wouldn't be a steak. But the food at all of your installation, and nothing is as nice. I, I was reading um, either this year or last year on November 10th, the Marine Corps' birthday. Um, that's always a good meal. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking about it and how wonderful it was. But now, in combat, you're going to have care rations, and all care rations taste alike. Uh -huh, but uh, the Marine Corps, the only outfit I imagine attached to the Navy would be aboard ship uh, because you've got an installation for cooking. Uh -huh. yeah. As far as your uh, equipage, uniforms, or anything like that, were there any pieces of equipage you thought were really useful, a really good thing to have, or was there stuff that you thought, why on earth did they ever issue me this? This is a you know, piece of garbage. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Marine always had good equipment. And of course you wouldn't you wouldn't put up with a rifle. See, um you were talking about weaponry. Um when I went in, we learned to fire the Thompson submachine gun. You see, because it was hand to hand, you could move in on a group of people. That was the kind of activity the Marine Corps had, had up until World War Two. But with World War Two and the type of uh, uh, activity that we had, you began to get a shift. I never, I, I did fire, I fired the Thompson sir, uh, for, just for qualification. Uh, what else did I fire? Uh, we had the um, Baron, uh, um, what was the BAR? It was an automatic weapon. And of course we, every Marine, up until the time I went through, boot training had to fire the O3. That's the old rifle that you had to cock and you had to fire and qualify with it before you got with the new rifle that had the, uh, the uh, um, you know, you could fire, what, eight rounds? And it with the, uh, with the, uh, the M1. Mm -hmm, the M1, right, right. The M1 was relatively new at World War II. Mm -hmm. But you had to qualify. I qualified as a sharpshooter. Well, I, I qualified as a sharpshooter on that and uh, the BAR and the Thompson Sub and the 45. Yeah. yeah. Now, after you were discharged and uh, you, you took your GI Bill and you came here to Atlanta, went to school, what did you do after you got out of school? 
after I finished school, I took all of my GI Bill, what, just 48 months? I took every penny. If the government does not know, owe me anything. I went four years through college. I really had the plan of uh, being a lawyer. My plans was to finish Morris Brown, and I took uh, what they call the pre-law, which was heavily history and government. And in my second year, I joined my fraternity. And one of my assignments as joining that uh, fraternity, as Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, was to identify, you know that, you must think that you like the alphas, don't you? <laughs> That's all right. We like to think that. Uh, one of my assignments was to meet a person in the profession I intended to go. I met a young attorney who had just finished Howard University. And he gave me some advice, and I kidded him about it. He died uh, a couple of years ago. But I never let him forget it. He gave me some rude awakening. He said to me, he wouldn't advise it. I really wanted some support. And I asked him why. And he told me, unless you have a family who can buy you a law library and support your, off your office for two years with at least a secretary, if you don't have that, I wouldn't advise you to suffer through law school. And I was angry when I left him. I was from enough. Why would he talk to me like? Why would he bust my dream? And I went back, but the more I began to think about it, that was my total investment. You know, I, I had gone to college against my father's way, uh, advice. His advice was U.S. Steel had, had saved me. See, during the war, if you were drafted, and you had a job, that company had to promise you a job when you return. And they had given me that job, and I think I worked about three months, and finally I said, I can't do this. This is too hard. And he said, I was crazy. You're married. You ought to be buying a home. You ought to take the GI Bill and buy your house, you see, which is his advice. Hey, I can't do it. And I, against his wishes, and the last thing he told me, my wife, had one more year, she was in junior college, she had been teaching with a, a certificate for two years college. And while overseas, I convinced her, you go ahead to college and finish college while you, uh, I'm overseas. I'll give you something to do. Because she was gonna go back to teach. No, I don't want you to teach. Go back and finish college and stay with my daddy, you know. And she had another year and he says, if you go, don't come back here. And I guess he came in on him. I think he still viewed me as a child. And I realized I wasn't ever going back. And I felt if I went and went through Howard and got a law degree and had to go back home, I would have failed. So I made my mind. I changed um, my major. Well, I couldn't change it because I had the subject. I began to take courses in business administration. And i never forget, I went in bookkeeping course, and I think, I wonder why I'm doing this. I'm almost a junior, and I'm going here taking a freshman course. But I did. Um, I took as many courses as I, as I did, and by that time, my advisor said, if I was going, I decided to go in the School of Business at Atlanta University that I would not have to have. I could still get the courses on graduate. But I went through and did my two years uh, uh, for the master's at AU and the last semester and my thesis. I did not have enough time, but my counselor with the Veterans Administration said he, would, uh, he wouldn't give me a check, which I did not need. I had full-time employment then. And, but he would pay the, the um, uh, tuition and give me the supplies so that I was able to finish all of it on the GI Bill. Uh, immediately after that, 
I had been selling home appliances. Uh, you couldn't buy refrigerators, washing machines, and that and right after the war. And they were just coming in. And I was very creative, did quite well. I think I made more money there than I ever did, uh, uh, you know, just commission. But uh, in conjunction with that, I had specialized. They didn't have specialty in the School of Business at Atlanta University then. But I leaned toward marketing. And uh, that's where my interest was. Well, connected with my selling, I knew every professor on the campus, knew every professional in the city, including Maynard Jackson's father, because I was selling them what they needed. So that um, Johnson Publishing Company, uh, at that time, Ebony and Jet, yeah. Um, Johnny Johnson had felt most of his advertisement in those magazines were cigarettes, beer, and maybe uh, cold drinks. No hard advertisement of automobiles and clothing and that kind of thing. And he, in his wisdom, decided that he wanted to go into that area. And um, he came looking for someone in Atlanta. And he said everywhere he went, and explain what he wanted. Even on the campus, they tell him, you need to see Mortimer Cox. He's just your person. And I did, and I did quite well. Um, I went with Johnson Publishing Company, and I enjoyed the work. It was travel. Johnny Johnson was a peculiar person I admire him for. Uh, for the first time in my life, you know, I traveled first class because he said the people you need to meet were never in court. You know, and I kind of like that. Too. Yeah. In the hotel, you stay first class, you know. I always go down and eat in the finest dining room, you know. And you would meet people. But I, I did, we did some exciting things. Um, I was very instrumental in getting the Chrysler Corporation, advertising cars, men clothing, Eagle suit, I remember that, and heavy food. Um, you know, chasing Steinbaum coffee, that kind of thing, just with the marking gimmick that I would come out. Atlanta would always show. I remember distinctly uh, in uh, 52 was Rich's downtown, and uh, we ran a uh, half page ad with the Eagle Clothes, which was a good line of suits at that time. I wanted to set the same ad up. Uh, into richest store for men on uh, uh, Forsyth Street. And uh, the buyer looked at me like he crazy. What? Put an ad with a black magazine in Riches downtown at that time? Yes, what's wrong with it? I wanted to put my ass scene in Ebony sign. Mm -hmm. Let me think about it. So I went back and got all my friends and showed them the ad. Say, you go to Rich's and ask for this outfit. Now, I knew that all I wasn't going to buy it. But by the time I did it, the guy said he'd never seen an ad generate that kind of activity. And all these guys, they were college professors, businessmen, you know, ministers, and that kind of thing. They, were, they could afford it. So that he said to me, uh, I've never had that. He said, that's unusual, and I sold some outfit. He said, I'd like to do something nice, but that ad, I don't know. I said, all I want to do is to get that ad, get me a photographer, and shoot it. And then you can do whatever you want to do. I didn't say it had to be up there for two weeks. He said, that's all you want? I said, he said, you can do that. So he sent the uh, decorator and, and all. They set the one up just like it. I shot it. Eagle has never figured out to this day how they couldn't get it done in New York, in you know, Los Angeles, or anywhere else, but he had riches in Atlanta. But they went with him, but it was that. I would have stayed with him, um, but after, uh, I'd stayed with him almost two years, he wanted me to move to Detroit. I'd been to Detroit because I had a brother there 
and Detroit had begun to deteriorate in terms of crime downtown in the inner city. I just didn't want to go. My wife had begun to teach. She had come over and gotten her master's, and she was teaching in that public school system. I was doing quite well myself, and I saw no reason to go. I finally told him, and he did terminate me right on the spot, <laughs> sitting in his office. <laughs> but but my, my, my concern here is that, and as I look back over it, I'm in a in a position, in a career that I could do. I know I could do it. I know I could be successful. But Saturday Evening Post wasn't going to hire me if Johnson & Johnson had the only magazine and the publishing agents that could afford me. So I had to make a choice. This, this I can't afford to risk because I put all my investment into having the kind of life. I left that.